Thank you very much, Tommy. Um, I think there's, before I start my talk, there's one last very important thank you, and that's to our conference co-chairs, Jeff Beck and Tommy Osden, for doing yet a fantastic job of organizing JATSCON this year. So thank you very much. <laughs> Not long ago, I was rattled out of a deep sleep around 3 in the morning. I tried to roll over and go back to sleep, but there was that pesky noise about five minutes later. You all know that sound, I'm sure, the dying battery in a smoke detector. Maybe I can cover my head with the pillow, I thought, and ignore it until morning. That was it. I knew I'd be up all night if I didn't get up and deal with it. So I got out of bed, found a chair, dragged it over under the offending device, twisted it off the mount, unhitched the connecting cable, and tried to extract the dead 9-volt battery. Then the real problems began. This was the smoke detector at the top of the stairway, and in my half-awake stupor, I ignored my precarious position on the chair. As I gave one last tug on the battery to pry it loose from the two-prong connector, the smoke detector went flying out of my hands, skittered down the stairs, bounced off the baseboard, and came to a wobbly stop, the cover about a foot away from the base. I trudged barefoot down the stairs to collect the pieces and to get another battery from the kitchen closet when I felt something sharp dig into my heel. I stopped, squinted down at the step, and picked up a small piece of plastic. At the bottom, I picked up the two halves of the smoke detector, and when I tried to put it back, to get back together, I realized that the broken piece, which had nearly pierced my foot, was the magic tab to connect the cover and the base. It didn't take me long to realize that the three pieces were not going to be made whole again, even with the help of superglue. So I trudged back to bed and figured I'd deal with it in the morning. The next morning, I called the manufacturer and spoke with a very pleasant representative who informed me that replacement units were not available. It turned out that the new product line was developed according to a different standard than the old product line, and since I have seven smoke detectors in my house and all were interconnected, I'd have to replace all seven. As I swore under my breath about this, I thought to myself, do I really have to purchase seven new smoke detectors because of the one unit that I dropped and broke? Why couldn't they have a backwards compatible system? Well, I got lucky, and eventually I tracked down a compatible unit, and I didn't have to replace all the others. But I wasn't thrilled about the process of coercing this foreign unit into the system. This incident came to mind recently, but the context was a little bit different. After I fumbled the smoke detector, I was trying to purchase a compatible device. The incident in the more recent case was to help a customer who had a completely custom DTD. And I was trying to figure out how to coerce into their system some JATS-compatible transforms to solve a problem that was similar to one in their custom environment. Now, this customer had some valid reasons for having a custom DTD. But as I thought about this specific situation involving an appendix element, I began to reflect on how much development work we'd done to support their custom model. It's not that their model predated JATS and BITS. It didn't, actually. They just had a different workflow where jats and bits didn't quite fit at this particular stage. But I kept wondering again about the extra costs for all those customizations, just like the extra costs for replacing seven smoke detectors rather than one. In a similar vein, we started to work with a new customer five years ago, and they proudly sent me their custom schema. I took a look at it and suggested that NLM Book would be a better fit. There was nothing in their schema that NLM Book didn't already handle. No, they replied, they had just spent a lot of money to have their schema developed, and so another model just wouldn't be as good. I quickly realized that, exp that explaining, cajoling, or pleading wasn't likely to change any mind, so we went ahead and implemented their schema. And as they started to work with the implementation, they discovered holes in the model as they created more and more content. For six months, it seemed like we were receiving a new XSD every other week. And with each schema revision, we had to update the transform. And sadly, as the costs ran up for the project, I knew that almost all of these revisions were cases that NLM Book gracefully handled out of the box. 
but the customer was basically paying to reinvent the wheel. I found solace when I remembered that only a dozen years ago, XML was always that way. Back then, back really at the turn of the century, every SGML or XML implementation for a scholarly publisher took a lot of time and money and a word we haven't used this week, courage. Back then, we had no broadly accepted standard DTD. Well, sure, we had ISO 12083, but almost nobody used it without extensive modifications. We had Elsevier DTD versions 3 and 4. If you went looking around further for DTD to use for scholarly publishing, that was pretty much all that you were going to find. Well, somebody once commented about ISO 12083. It's way too complicated, yet it's not flexible enough to represent all the things I need to have in the journal I publish on the internet. And there were the major Elsevier DTD versions of the late 90s, which, much to Elsevier's credit, they released both the DTDs and the documentation to public view. And as one of the first major publishers to start large-scale, full-text SGML deliveries, a lot of us in the implementation business came to know those DTDs really well. So many times, when a DTD was needed for a new project back then, we didn't start from scratch. A lot of projects started with the Elsevier Foundation and modified it for the project's own needs. That's how, you, that's how we ended up with, among others, the Keaton DTD, the CellPress DTD, the Highwire DTD, and of course, the PubMed Central 1.0 DTD. They all had firm roots in the Elsevier model. But the Elsevier DTDs were not perfect, as shown in part by their evolution over a 10-year period. They served Elsevier's needs well, in part because Elsevier required a certain degree of structural conformance in their publications but they were less well suited to some of the other publications to which they were being adapted. And as I look back on that era with the knowledge of where JATS is today, I think most of the DTDs of that time period, including ones I helped to develop, were flawed. The NLM and JATS DTDs, which followed, allowed a much greater degree of flexibility. As we've seen over the past two days of presentations and now five, am I correct, five JATSCon meetings? Wow, JATSCon at five, who would have thought? JATS has succeeded in providing a standard foundation for journal publishers. Publishers have been able to adopt this model, out of the box or with modification, to solve a wide range of interchange and production problems faster and at a lower pro project cost than they could 15 years ago. Not that JATS is perfect. The working group has certainly made our share of mistakes along the way. And we've heard plenty of suggestions for improvements, including suggestions that have been made in the last two days. And admittedly, there are times when the working group would like to fix, there, there are a number of items the working group would like to fix if given the opportunity to break backwards compatibility. But please, don't worry. This is definitely not an announcement that we're going to break backwards compatibility anytime soon. I think there's general consensus in the working group that any move in that direction would be done with lots of advance notice. After all, there are still more than a few organizations using NLM 2.3 because 3.0 was not backwards compatible. And 3.0 was released in 2008, that's seven years ago. I'm merely acknowledging that JATS is also not perfect, but JATS is a long sight better than many of the DTDs we worked with 15 years ago. I think you'll agree, though, that despite the flaws, the JATS family is a great foundation for lots of projects. If you don't agree, I suspect that you probably would, have, would not have spent the last two days sitting in here. <laughs> Furthermore, JATS has proven to the community that standardization brings cost savings and scalability. Twenty years ago, the community didn't have enough operational experience to successfully create a tag set. 12083 was a good first try, but it was not a success because it was not informed enough by actual use. Or, as the inventor Charles F. Kettering once wrote, 99% of success is built on failure. Fifteen years ago, a journey into XML for journal publishers required, required a research and development project to create a DTD, or perhaps adopt one from a publisher that might prove, I'm sorry, from a vendor that might prove problematic if you changed vendors a few years later. Today you can use JATS, often but not necessarily always off the shelf, and avoid the R&D costs. Furthermore, 
suppliers and tool vendors have developed solutions around these standards so that the costs have become to, so that the cost to have an XML workflow and all the benefits that XML can provide is much lower today than it was 15 years ago. Last week I was reminded of another story from that bygone era. I think most of you are probably familiar with Highwire Press. Highwire started to host full text journal content in May 1995 with the Journal of Biological Chemistry. This was an impressive feat as there were very few journals with full text content available online anywhere 20 years ago or 20 years ago even this month. The DTD used by JBC was informed by the earlier work of the American Association of Publishers, 1283, and Elsevier. But it was a unique DTD. In their early years, Highwire accepted SGML according to whatever DTD the publisher may have developed. And each of these DTDs was typically developed for the unique needs of a specific journal or project, not a generalized solution for a wide range of titles. For each DTD, Highwire then built a custom parser that converted the publisher's SGML into HTML for presentation on the website. After a half dozen of these projects, though, JBC, Science, Cell, and a few others, Highwire began to realize that it wasn't a sustainable model. So they built their own DTD, and like many of us at the time, they looked around at what they could use, and they based their DTD on Elsevier 4.1 and called it the Highwire DTD. Then they asked publishers to deliver SGML according to the Highwire DTD. This was a more sustainable approach that I'll call Highwire 2.0, except that if a publisher wanted the, uh, to send content to another host like PubMed Central, then yet another conversion was required. But at least it solved Highwire's problem of writing a custom transform for each publisher's content. And for its time, it was a great solution. So, Imagine my surprise last week when I heard a Highwire 1.0 type of situation starting to brew. It occurred at a meeting of standards publishers. Now, I have to admit that ever since I started to work with SGML in 1995, I, and I would look at standards publishers from the distance, I'd be somewhat amused at the fact that there were no standards in XML for the publishing of standards. If you looked around, ISO didn't have a tag set or a standard tag set. IEEE didn't. ASTM didn't. Nobody did. No one, it seemed, had standardized what you would think was probably the single most obvious model to standardize in the world. So here I was last week in a room full of standards publishers. A few had already dipped their toes into the waters of XML, and only half of them had done it successfully. But most haven't even tried. There had just been several talks during the day about XML workflows for standards publishers, and we were in the closing roundtable discussion when a content aggregator suggested that if each of the publishers in the room could just send over XML in their own format, then the aggregator would write a transform for each publisher into a common format that they could then ingest into their system. I see you smiling, Rob. <laughs> Rob was in the room. I did a double take. I hope you did too, Rob. Did I really hear that? After all the lessons learned from the past 20 years in journal publishing, my reaction could only be described as visceral, but perhaps that's an indication I've just been in this business a little too long. But I'm actually surprised that the smoke coming out of my ears at that moment didn't set off the smoke detectors in the room. I mean, I, I just, I was shaking, and that doesn't usually happen to me. So why would I have reacted that way? Well. As I think we've mentioned a few times today already, about four years ago, ISO, and you all know who ISO is, right? ISO date, attribute, ISO entities, or if you're not, anyone here not an XML geek? Okay, is there anyone here who's never actually looked at a tag? You're just here because you're involved with a company that does XML. Yes, I, <laughs> ISO, if you've never heard of anything, you've probably heard of ISO 9001, which is their quality standard. You've driven past factories, ISO 9001 certified. So they're a big deal in the standards business. Well, ISO had a production problem. Their problem was that they were stuck in a workflow of Word to PDF. They had no full text XML, and they just couldn't seem to get there no matter how many times they tried to change their workflow. And believe me, it had been more than a couple. Part of the problem was that they didn't have a solid DTD target for XML in the first place. 
But back in 2011, when they were ready to make another run at solving the problem, they looked around and they realized a few things. The first was that, ironically, there was no standard XML tag set for standards. The second was that there were already standard DTDs for markup of full text content that really was similar to ISOs, not exactly the same. And there, there were really four major tag sets. There was DocBook, there was DITA, there was <coughs> TEI. Um, is that the rigor now? We have to cough before we say that. Um, and there was, of course, JATS. Now, all four of these are great DTD models, and all four of them could handle any reasonable text document. But when it came to standards, there were some compromises that would have had to be made to use any of the four of them out of the box. So since none of the four was quite right, what ISO did was the next logical step. They engaged some outside expertise and evaluated all four models and finally decided that JATS would be the right foundation. And they built a profile of JATS for standard-specific content. The resulting DTD, as I mentioned earlier, is known as the ISO Standard Tag Suite, or ISO STS. And it's been part of a solution that's enabled ISO to, over the last three years, cut publication times from typically over six months to now two weeks for the majority of their standards. And they've also measured their internal paper use, and it used to be 11 tons per year. It's now down to, I believe it's a half ton per year. Is Chandy still in the room? Okay, Ch Chandy could cross-check me on that. I believe it's under a half ton per year. Not that the DTD was responsible for these changes, but it was one piece of a larger workflow change that enabled these kinds of truly dramatic changes for ISO. Now, ISO was just trying to solve a production problem, but they went a step further. Just as NLM put the NLM DTD out in the public for anyone to use back in 2003, ISO made the STS tag set freely available to the community. So when I heard the suggestion that standards development organizations should each submit XML according to their own schema, there was more than a little smoke coming out of my ears. Why reinvent the same workflow that Highwire had found un unsustainable 20 years ago? At the time that Highwire did it, their solutions made sense. But with the degree of standardization we have available today around full text schemas, it just made no sense at all. So yesterday at lunch, I can tell you, I was delighted to see a group of 10 or so attendees, I think most are still in this room, all from different standards publishers huddled around one table, and I think they were talking about this specific problem. Uh, that's really, really good news. So I think maybe we've got a standard for standards finally brewing. And then, of course, there's BITS. BITS started out as the NLM book project based on the needs of uh, based on the NLM book DTD and specifically set up for the needs of the NCBI bookshelf project. Some of us looked over and saw it and said, you know, for some of these book projects we've got, it may be useful. But admittedly, just barely. But it was a toehold and there was community interest. So back in the summer of 2011, NLM started the BITS project to do a proper DTD. Thank you, Jeff, for getting that sponsored. We had an initial face-to-face -face meeting with about a dozen people. Not everyone could make it. Uh, a major hurricane had just rolled up the East Coast. And John Meyer, are you still here? John wanted to call in. He had no telephone, as I recall. So we, we missed you at we missed you at that meeting, John. From the first moment, though, there was really great synergy between the two sag the, between the two tag sets, Jats and uh, Bits came out. The Bits name came out of that meeting. Uh, I think at one point there was a suggestion we have jats and bats, but we decided that wouldn't quite fly. So uh, we ended up with bits, which worked a little bit better. Um, but one of the interesting things during that meeting, and I think you even saw a little of this interaction today between Jeff and Laura, is we'd talk about something and someone would finally say, you know, that sounds like a really great suggestion for the jats group. Let's recommend it over. And after, I think it was the afternoon of the second day, after we'd done about six or seven of these, there was one woman at the table who sounded very concerned, and she sort of looked at the rest of the people in the room and said, you know, I'm worried that we're sending all this stuff over to the JATS group. Do you think they'll be okay getting it? You know, is there anyone around the table who's in the JATS working group? 
to which all of us nearly fell off of our chairs because I think she was one of only two people in the room who wasn't in the JATS working group. And we, of course, had forgotten to mention to her that most of us were in it. But as I reflect on all of these projects, there's a common thread that stands out. Each of them started not as an effort to create a standard, but to solve a production problem. And LM and JAT started out as a project to solve the very real and immediate problems of PubMed Central and the archive that would eventually be called Portico. BIT started out as the NLM Book DTD to solve the problem at NCBI Bookshelf. And ISO STS started out specifically to solve a, pro a production problem, and it was literally just a production problem at ISO. None of these projects were started with the intent to create a standard. All of these projects started small, the, but through community involvement, grew to their current levels of success. With hindsight, you'd almost, had, you'd almost thought, have thought that this was planned by the original NLM DTD working group, but it certainly wasn't. There were some who actually did dream that such a standard would be possible. Uh, I was looking back through some old emails recently, and some of you may know a man named Richard O'Byrne, who was at the time at Blackwell Science, I believe uh, now he is at Oxford University Press. And back in November of 2001, so almost 14 years ago, he wrote an email to me, and I think it's worth reading the email to you. He wrote, I think it would be really great to get publishers together to agree on a common DTD, or at least a common exchange DTD. I know that this idea has been kicking around for years and that ISO 12083 could be used, but nobody does. It just seems that the time is right to float this idea for various reasons. Everyone's in Crossref and passing legacy data back and forth when journals change publisher. Each publisher has to throw a lot of resources at repurposing the data from the former publisher's DTD and then update Crossref. Added to that, publishers are all consolidating their lists of type typesetting suppliers and we're all using many typesetters in common. That seems to be another compelling economic reason for some kind of co agreed common DTD for both XML in typesetting and also for back conversion to XML. But of course, many people still think their DTD is better than anyone else's and that there's an advantage to doing things in a proprietary way, bizarrely. I think attitudes are changing and everyone realizes that this SGML XML stuff is difficult and complex and anything which might make it cheaper slash easier would be welcomed. End of soapbox. The conventional wisdom about, that, about the time that I received that email was that a single DTD for scholarly publishing was impossible. After all, the scholarly publishing community had broadly declined to adopt either the AAP DTD or 12083. But fortunately, conventional wisdom has a way of being found wrong in hindsight. We never set out to create a standard when we started this project back in 2002. After all, some of us in the room today had been told not long before that in absolutely no uncertain terms that such a project was impossible. Yes, let me say that again. The project was considered impossible. My favorite inventor, Charles F. Kettering, once wrote, the Wright brothers flew right through the smokescreen of impossibility. Well, I think it's fair to say that Jet Jats also flew right through that smokescreen, too. So, Jats, like the Wright brothers, has taken flight. Bits is flexing its wings, and STS is a fledgling looking to be pushed out of the nest. Perhaps these two latter might be considered a skewmorph of Jats, and Dana, thank you for introducing me to that word yesterday. Uh, perhaps BITS and STS will become new standards, and like Dana's work, we'll only be calling further derivative uses beyond what people had originally expected, skewmorphs. But even then, what a great foundation we have for starting projects that may not exactly fit the model of journal or book or standard. Regardless of what you call it, I think the community has really done something quite amazing. Not just the working groups for these projects, but the larger community that Evan Owens described yesterday morning in his talk. These projects have succeeded because of a community effort. Like the Wright brothers, we've learned from our mistakes and from our failures. And because of that, 
We've moved from the impossible to the possible, and we've flown through the smokescreen of impossibility. Thank you very much. And thank you once again to coming to ChatsCon 2015, and may you all have safe travels home. <laughs>